Okay, we're picking up in uh, Philippians uh, chapter 3, starting in verse 4. I'll just read through verses 1 through 3. A quick recap. We remember that Paul was writing to the Philippians in the first verse of chapter 3. He begins to close the letter. And as we said, it's almost as if Paul stops himself, thinks for a moment, says, you know, there's something else I want to say here. And he begins to talk to the Philippian church about the Judaizers who are coming around. They've been coming around. They've been persecuting the church. They've been um, coming around harassing, really is a better word, um, the church, um, trying to get Gentile believers to begin to conform themselves to the Mosaic law through circumcision, dietary laws, Mosaic law. And um, and so Paul, it, it's really, they're really his main opponent um, to his theology of salvation. And so Paul begins to attack them, and he begins to set up his case for his soteriology, his theology of salvation. Um, and in verse 4, Paul begins to mock their position by highlighting his own superior credentials, right? Because they're coming in these churches and they're like, hey, listen, we're Jews, we're from Jerusalem, and we come, you know, to bring you into line, right? Like you, you did good here and here by believing on Christ, but that's a Jewish Messiah. In order to, be, to believe in a Jewish Messiah, you have to become Jewish. You have to be circumcised. You have to follow the dietary laws, and you have to blah, 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 all the things to earn their own righteousness. No, Paul's like, no, we are saved by grace through faith in Christ. That's the whole point. And so he begins to highlight his own credentials to kind of just make fun of their position, right? And so he says in verse 4, um, well, just read through. It says, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble for me and is safe to you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship the, by the Spirit of God in glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Verse 4, here's where we begin, right? Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone thinks he has reason for the confidence in the flesh, I have more. And begins to list his credentials here, right? So he says, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, I was a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. Right? And so Paul lists his credentials. I want to note that the first four, they have to do more with his um, the benefits that came from his heritage. Just being born, right? He was born into these things here. And so the first thing he mentions is circumcised, right? Um, he says... Uh, circumcised on the eighth day is the first thing, like the main thing, right, that they're harassing the church about. Look, I'm circumcised. I was circumcised on the eighth day, right, um, of the people of Israel, right? So circumcision, remember what we said was the was like the sign, seal, of uh, symbol of being a part of the covenant of the people of God. So to become a person of God, a male had to be circumcised in his foreskin. So to be part of the family of God, the children of Israel. And so, hey, I'm circumcised. I'm circumcised on the eighth day, right? Just as the law prescribes. Of the people of Israel, like I'm born into it, right? I am an Israelite myself by blood and biology. I'm a child of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. So I'm not some lowly tribe. I'm not some tribe that transgressed. I'm the tribe of Benjamin, a respected tribe, right? Um, a Hebrew of Hebrews. I don't, you don't get any more Jewish than me. I am a Jew of Jews. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. He says, now, now those are his, by birth, his next three are his achievements. And so he says, as to the law, a Pharisee, right? So the Pharisees were known to be a group of people who had noticed, had seen the the the, the uh, wickedness of Israel, how they had just kind of ceased following the law and being obedient to the law of Moses. And so they had um, decided they were going to usher in the Messiah through perfect obedience to the law, right? And so outwardly, this was a group of people actually who you, you can't fault um, their the their outward display of righteousness, right? They they did their utmost to follow the letter of the law to perfection. And so he says, as to the law, a Pharisee, right? As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless, all right? So he's not saying, hey, not sinless. He's saying, I'm blameless. Like I had no scandal. No one could point to my life and say, yeah, he acted like this outwardly behind closed doors. He was like this. There, there was nothing that could be spoken about him negatively. Paul's track record was perfect and clean. Um, and so he points all this out because these things elevate him. Paul was an MVP uh, of, of the Jewish world. 
um, in, in his day. He was the perfect specimen in terms of devotion and high achievement in Judaism. He was the real deal. And you really, literally couldn't do any better than Paul in terms of being Jewish, right? But even for Paul, this wasn't enough. All that he achieved, it wasn't enough. Um, and if you wanted to take that path, Paul's point is this, if you want to take that path, if you want to start down that road and say, I'm going to be, I'm going to be justified by my own righteousness, then you have to do better than I did. You got to do better than that. In fact, you have to do perfect. And, and the fact is, the point of this is that no one could ever do it. That's the whole point, right? Which is why God had to send his son and his son, the son, God, the son had to come to earth, be born of a virgin and do it for us. That's the point, right? And so verse 7, he says, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ, right? So all those things that I valued the most in my life, my heritage, my circumcision, my being born of the tribe of Benjamin, being the best Hebrew I could be, a Pharisee, like achieving the rank of Pharisee. I mean, few could have, could attain to that. Um, um, being the most fervent in my persecution of the, the Christian church, right? Um, and, and, and being faultless, blameless under the law. Um, um, all of that. These are high achievements, high accolades, m much respected in the Jewish community. But he says, um, uh, but whatever gain I had, all of that stuff was so stuff that he valued in his life. I counted as a loss for the sake of Christ. And the fact is that um, they were a loss to him and not just a loss, but almost like you could say like a liability, right? In terms of um, uh, they were a liability to genuine saving faith because um, what these things did, these this heritage, these accolades, these achievements, um, they they blinded him for much of his life to his genuine need for true righteousness that could only come through saving faith in Christ. Um, and so in verse 8, he says, um, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Savior, um, my, my Lord, I mean. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Um, so it's not that his holy living, his achievements, the, the, the external righteousness that he practiced, it's not that those things were necessarily bad, right? Um, living holy is a good thing, and there's benefits to doing that. Just natural benefits according to the, the laws of the universe that God's put in place. It's not that it's bad, and the things, the good things of the earth are not bad. Family and friends and love and kindness and friendship, and those things are not bad. Good works are not bad, Right? Um, they, it's not that they have no value. It's that the value of knowing Christ so far surpass, surpasses the, their, the, the worth of those things that, that alongside of that, the, they're worthless, right? Um, and, and, and Paul had lost things in his life. Um, some say, you know, the Pharisees, um, part of being a Pharisee was that you had to be married, a married man. And so if that's the case, then Paul must have been married um, when he was a Pharisee, and yet you, you never hear about Paul's wife, right? And so it's very possible that Paul, um, when, he, when he was converted to Christ, he actually lost his wife because of that. Um, Paul had lost his respect and his status and his, his freedom and his eyesight. Um, you know, and I don't know if that was like a physical infirmity, if it was a result of maybe being stoned and left for dead, shipwrecked on an island, bit by a snake. I mean, we don't know. Um, but he says, for, for his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things. And, and I count them as rubbish, right? I count them as rubbish. I count them as trash. I count them as dung um, that I may, in order that I may gain Christ. And, and, and then verse nine, um, it says that I may gain Christ and be found in him right? To be found in him. And, and Paul was found, wasn't it? Wasn't he? He was found by Christ. In the middle of persecuting Christ's church, in the, in the middle of, Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Right? Knocks him off his horse, takes away his eyesight, eyesight blinds him for three days, and, and, he, and, he, and he saves him. Um, he finds him in the midst of all of his zeal against Christ, and he saves him in the midst of that, that I may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that depends on upon the law, but that may, which comes that depend that depends on faith. And that, that's an important thing, right? That he says right there, right? Everything that Paul had done up to that point in his life for uh, up to his conversion, 
um, had been to become more righteous in and of his own power through obedience to the law of Moses, right? But now Paul had been found in and by Christ. And, and, and it's funny because he hadn't even realized at the time how truly lost he was, right? Because he was caught up in doing all these things. And I feel like a good person, you know, all the old ladies I helped across the street, you know, I'm, I'm a good person, right? And, and, and now Paul found himself clothed in the true righteousness, the genuine righteousness, the real eternal righteousness of Christ that only comes through faith in Christ. And he says it depends on faith, right? Um, that, 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 which, that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness of God that depends on faith. In other words, um, it, it can't be earned, right? It can't be earned through anything that I could ever have done. It can only be received. It can only be received by, by utterly depending on and placing my trust in it and standing upon, putting my full weight upon um, Jesus Christ for my salvation. He says that I may know him in verse 10, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings becoming like him in death. It's like I'd gladly give away everything I have and everything I am that I just might know him. I mean, how beautiful is that? I just want to know him. Like, I, 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 and that's what we're saved into, right? That implies relationship. I just want to know him. Relationship is what we're saved into. It's not, we're not saved into religious observance. We're not saved into church membership or attendance. We're not saved into a list of do's and don'ts. We're not, we're not saved into living a clean and moral upright life. We're saved into relationship with God and we're changed simply by our proximity to him and by being cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, right? We are saved by him that we might know him. And, and that implies intimacy, like deep intimacy. We're not saved into servitude. We're saved into into sonship. It, oh, what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we might be called the children of God, um, that I might know him. And he says, and the power of his resurrection, um, the power of his resurrection over my flesh that's always warring against my spirit, over my weakness and over my failures and my fears and my, my wickedness and my selfishness and my narcissism and the evil desires within me and my religious arrogance and pride, my sickness, my mortality, um, that, I may, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection to, to resurrect me, to, to, to take out my heart of stone and to put in its place a heart of flesh, right? Um, and it says, um, uh, and I may, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings. Um, this is beautiful. There's two, there's two sides, two ways to look at this, um, to share in his sufferings. One is our benefit. Uh, from his sufferings, the way that we benefit with it. Like Isaiah 53, um, verses 4 through 5 says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Those are the ways that we are benefiting from the sufferings of Christ, right? But he's also talking about the other side, um, the communion with Christ in suffering, right? Um, Paul has already suffered greatly. Remember in Philippians chapter 1, Paul said, For it has been granted to you um, that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his namesake. See, Paul had experienced much suffering for the sake of Christ, and it wouldn't be long before the believers in Rome um, uh, I'm sorry, the believers in, in, in Galatia and Macedonia and in Rome and all over the world um, began to feel that same suffering, the deep suffering. Nero was going to go crazy, start persecuting Christians, doing crazy things um, to Christians. And, and Christians were already um, experiencing suffering. Paul, Paul and Silas experienced suffering when they first came to Philippi. So the church is not unfamiliar with this, right? Um, uh, but he's teaching that we might um, embrace that experience of suffering, that we might embrace it, that we might have commune with him in our mutual suffering, right? Um, and it says, becoming like him in death. Philippians chapter 2, um, remember, um, talking about Christ, Paul said, but he made himself nothing, taking on the form of a servant, 
being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death upon a cross. Um, Jesus' life and death were given in perfect obedience to God the Father. And, and Paul is willing to follow Jesus' example, both in his life and um, in giving his life, to the point of even giving his life um, in obedience and submission to the Lord. Um, remember in Philippians 1, when he's talking about his coming appointment with Nero, not knowing what was going to happen to him, and he says, um, it is his confident hope that that Christ will be honored in my body, he says, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And verse 11, the final verse for today, it says that by any means possible, I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. And so just as Paul was willing to follow Christ all the way unto death, so also he fully expected to follow Christ into resurrected life. Amen. Um, that, that then, um, on that day, um, whether Christ returned during life or whether he called him um, in death, that, that he would finally shed the wicked, unrighteous uh, flesh and be made whole and fully righteous and redeemed both inside and out, apart from the law, uh, apart from Moses, apart from all of it, right? And see what the Judaizers had been trying to do is they'd been trying to externally conform flesh first through circumcision and 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 paul's like what's the point you know when we can be saved by grace through faith in christ and when we get there he's going to return to redeem our mortal flesh so what does that have to do with me so hope you enjoyed it